plea to the foreigner by Baba Sahib Ambedkar. 2. There is another reason why the foreigner lends his support to the Congress. It lies in the difference between the demonstrative activities of the Congress and the other political parties in the country. While he compares the activities of the different political parties, he sees congressmen engaged in a conflict with the British government, launching campaigns of civil disobedience, breaking laws made by a foreign government, organizing movements for non-payment of taxes, courting prison, preaching non-cooperation with government, refusing offices, and exhibiting themselves in other ways as men out to sacrifice themselves for the freedom of the country. On the other hand, he sees the other political parties uninterested, passive, and taking no part in such a struggle. From this, he concludes that the Congress is a body struggling for the freedom of India, while the other parties are indifferent, if not obstructive, and, as a lover for freedom, feels bound to support the Congress as a body carrying on a fight for freedom in preference to other parties. This is quite natural, but a question arises which calls for immediate attention. Is this partiality to the Congress the result of an infatuation for the fight for freedom movement? Or is it the result of a conviction that this fight for freedom is going to make the people of India free? If it is the former, all I can do is to regret that what I have said in Chapter 7 in explanation as to why the untouchables have not joined with the Congress in this fight for freedom has not produced the desired effect on the foreigner. But I cannot quarrel with him on that account. For it is quite understandable that many a foreigner on reading that chapter may say that while the reasons are deducted by me as to why the untouchables refuse to join the fight for freedom are valid and good, I have not shown any ground why he should not support a body which is carrying on a fight for freedom. If the basis of this partiality to the Congress is of the latter sort, then the matter stands on a different footing. It then becomes necessary to examine the rationale of his attitude and to save him from this error. Ordinarily, no one trusts the word of a person who is not prepared to place all his cards on the table and commit himself to something clear and definite, so as to prove his bona fides, to inspire confidence and secure the cooperation of those who have doubts about his motives. The same rule must apply to the Congress. But, as I have shown in Chapter 7, the Congress has not produced its blueprint on the sort of democracy it aims to establish in India, showing what place the servile classes, and particularly the untouchables, will have in it. Indeed, it has refused to produce such a blueprint, notwithstanding the insistent demand of the untouchables and the other minority communities. In the absence of such a pronouncement, it appears to be a strange sort of credulity on the part of the foreigner to give support to the Congress on the ground that it stood for democracy. There is certainly no ground for thinking that the Congress is planning to establish a democracy in India. The mere fact that the Congress is engaged in a fight for freedom does not warrant such a conclusion. Before any such conclusion is drawn, it is the duty of the foreigner to pursue the matter further and ask another question, namely, for whose freedom is the Congress fighting? The question whether the Congress is fighting for freedom has very little importance as compared to the question for whose freedom is the Congress fighting. This is a pertinent and necessary inquiry, and it would be wrong for any lover of freedom to support the Congress without furthering pursuing the matter and finding out what the truth is. But the foreigner who takes the side of the Congress does not care even to raise such a question. One should have thought that he would very naturally raise such a question, and if he did raise it and pursue it, I am confident he will find abundant proof that the Congress, far from planning for democracy, is planning to resuscitate the ancient form of Hindu polity of a hereditary governing class ruling a hereditary servile class. The attitude of the foreigner to the cause of the servile classes and particularly to the cause of the untouchables is a vital matter and no party can leave it out of consideration as a matter and a case of idiosyncrasy. For anyone representing the untouchables, it is necessary to take note of it and to do his best to convince the foreigner that in supporting the Congress, he is supporting a wrong party. The end.